Good afternoon and thank you for joining us today. We hope as you listen remotely that you and your families are healthy. I am Jennifer Schaus and we're coming to you live from downtown Washington, D.C. today. Our webinar was created in response to the COVID-19 virus. The virus impacts everyone and in multiple aspects of our lives, including how we make a living. Time is the most precious commodity, and with that, I want to thank everyone for taking the time out of their day for attending this presentation. I especially want to thank the speakers for their input and working with us on this project with very little notice. Anyone that knows me knows we have our speakers confirmed at least six to 12 months in advance and PowerPoints usually about a month in advance as well. I want to thank Mallory Flowers from my team who helped pull our speakers together and the PowerPoint in the wee hours last night. A very special shout out to the partners and friends who willingly came to us to spread the word. This includes Walt Abbott over at SCORE, Tara Palacios at the Arlington Economic Development Biz Launch, Luann Brosman and her team at Government Marketing University, Judy Bratt at Summit Insight with a nice new fancy logo, and our outstanding webinar partner, Scott Denniston and the great folks at the National Veterans Small Business Coalition. People I just mentioned are not only nice people, but they are strong leaders in the government contracting sector and in the community. If you don't know them, please make a point to connect. Before we get started, we just wanted to post um, and share the SBA link for disaster loans. These are for businesses that are eligible for assistance. On that note, uh, the webinar is being recorded. Uh, slides will be available on slideshare.net and the webinar will be on our YouTube channel and website about a few minutes after we finish. Okay, and how, here's how things are gonna work today. Uh, I'm gonna introduce our speakers and we've got two from each category. So we've got two government contracts attorneys, two public affairs professionals, two bankers, two finance, uh, financial planners, and two procurement experts. Each speaker is then gonna make a very brief statement. They know they're limited to 60 seconds or less, so we're gonna start playing the music. Uh, and they're gonna uh, talk about the current situation from their vantage point. We're then gonna go through the 41 questions that were emailed to us, and we've got a speaker lined up for each question. And again, they've got a minute or less to answer. So all in all, the webinar today should take about an hour. If you do have any questions that were not uh, answered, we're going to have the speaker's contact information on the last slides. You can also email us at the hello at jennifershouse.com email address, which is at the bottom of every slide. Okay, so let's dig in. Uh, we've got our legal speakers, uh, and we're going to start off here with Mary Beth Bosco, who's been a great colleague and a great friend over the years. She's with the very respective law firm of Holland and Knight. So Mary Beth, thank you so much for joining us on short notice, and in 60 seconds or less, can you please share your thoughts from a legal perspective? Sure, Jennifer, thanks so much for putting this together. Um, the main thought is that nobody really knows how to get through this. We're in unprecedented times, and as government contractors, I think you are starting to recognize there's no clear uh, guidance coming from the agencies as yet. Um, they're more focused, it seems like, on their own um, um, their own employees. So we get we're getting lots of questions from our clients about what to do. Uh, probably the most important thing is take an inventory of your contracts to see if they've got excusable delay clauses, to see if you have a requirement to give notice of changes or delays. Um, and also to see if um, you've got DPAS rating, which we'll talk about. Um, to the extent you are incurring uh, costs, additional costs and delay, document it, document it, document it. And then third, stay in communication with your contracting officers and also uh, your suppliers or your prime contractors. Thanks. Super, thank you. And next up is my good friend and colleague, Margaret Cassidy. She's legal counsel over at Cassidy Law. Margaret, thanks for joining us. 60 seconds or less, your, uh, your thoughts, please. Thanks for having me, Jennifer. Um, my thoughts are similar to Mary Beth's. Um, we are in some unprecedented territory here. Um, the questions that Jennifer's posed today are going to give you a lot of the information that I know my clients have been asking about. But I think some important things to remember is that um, just as you all are confused, your government colleagues, your contracting officers and other in the government are confused. 
as well about what to do. They may not know how to to handle a termination for convenience, a termination for cause. They may not understand um, about the fact that there are times when um, there's a force majeure, what we call it as lawyers, uh, a force that makes it such that you can't perform and, and um, penalties should be avoided in those situations. So I think what you need to do is when you're given direction or told to do something by your contracting officer, I think you need to make sure that you know that that is consistent with the law. Um, you also need to keep track of those conversations that you're having with the contracting officer, keep track of your emails with them, and just, as, as Mary Beth said, just document everything that you have that is going on and understand um, that they may not have it right and you need to make sure that you get it right because, as somebody's asked us a question about, there will be audits um, at some point later, years from now, and you need to be ready. Super, thank you. Okay, now we move on to our public affairs speakers. Um, these folks are uh, individuals that know legislation in Capitol Hill inside and out. Uh, so we'll kick it off here with D.L. McNeil, one of my most favorite people on the planet. He's well-dressed, he's smart, and uh, D.L. is the managing director over at Longview Global. D.L., in 60 seconds or less, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Jennifer, and thanks for pulling this together. I do echo what my previous two uh, colleagues have said. These are unprecedented times. In our space, I would urge you to communicate uh, as much as possible, specifically what your companies are experiencing, and do not forget, uh, which we'll talk about uh, in some greater detail later, uh, to notify your, your congressmen, your, your senators, and their offices to, to better help you understand uh, some, some pretty uh, sweeping legislation that have been passed in very short order. I will say that in many cases, it takes months for this stuff to pass and we still can't understand it. So we know that there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of, of misunderstanding about what is and isn't uh, in the packages and, and what's in the law. So I would encourage you to tell your story, but also to try and better understand the specificity within these three packages. Super, thank you. And next up, we've got uh, Crystal Ellerby. She's the VP of Federal Relations over at Strategies 360. And I'm glad, Crystal, that you're able to join us on short notice. So uh, in 60 seconds or less from your vantage point, please. Uh, good afternoon, Jennifer. Um, having gone through Hurricane Katrina when I worked on the Hill for Senator Vitter, this is bringing back flashbacks, but it's on a larger scale. And one of the things that federal contractors need to understand is that they need to let their local government officials know how this is impacting them. During the shutdown last year, government contractors did not get any money back um, because of the lapse in appropriations. And so what I have been telling my clients who are, who are government contractors, that they need to assess what they need economically and they need to reach out to their delegation. And that's what's one of the things that we've been doing. Um, as of right now, there has been numerous pieces of legislation. I mean, over the last two days alone, there are probably over 50 separate pieces of legislation with regards to the coronavirus. And um, this is going to continue on until next year because, again, this is unprecedented in its nature and scope. And so we're all in new territory right here. And, again, you know, stress that government contractors need to have their voices heard. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal. I appreciate that. Uh, now we're going to move on to our financial planning speakers because it does uh, come down to money. So Matt Coons uh, from Edward Jones, who's been a great supporter of our conferences and events. He's a financial planner again with Edward Jones. Matt, uh, the floor is all yours. Hi, thanks for having me. And uh, thanks, Jennifer, for putting together uh, this webinar so quickly. Uh, I just want to say that um, the, the COVID-19 impact on financial markets, it's been swift and severe, but I want to remind everybody that this is temporary, um, just uh, that the pandemic is temporary and the, the reaction of the market is, is temporary. It's going to be temporary. The, the depth of the market uh, decline as of now, it is actually average. It's, it, on the news, they always make it sound like the sky is falling, but it's actually average. The average being 30.33% since 1940, and we are right around about 30% as of now. The, the quickness of this market decline 
it is much faster than average. It usually takes several months, but this has been uh, really quick. And so the, the speed is uh, faster than average, but the depth is actually just average. Um, some have predicted the recovery will be equally quick, but of course there's no way to know. Um, we can, I can tell you that the average recovery takes seven months uh, since 1940. Uh, it's important to note that the best days in financial markets often come immediately after the worst days, which is why it's important to stay invested during periods of volatility. I'll use last Thursday and Friday as an example where it went down, you know, a little bit over 10% on Thursday and came up just a little bit under 10% on Friday. So those are very, very large uh, one-day swings, and so it's important to stay invested. Ultimately, all lasting, su lastingly successful investing is goal-focused and planning-driven, while all failed investing is market-focused and performance-driven. Similarly, successful investors are those who act continuously on a plan and towards the goal, while failed investors continue to react to market shocks. So stay the course, everybody. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Matt. And uh, next up is Ben Offit, a great entrepreneur and marketer. And thanks, Ben, for uh, helping to co-promote uh, this webinar today. And thanks for joining us. Uh, Ben's the principal at Offit Advisors. And Ben, 60 seconds or less. Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, this is a healthcare crisis with uh, very serious financial side effects. And the market has reacted quite negatively to this. Uh, but there's some positive things that we can all take away from this and things that you can do now with investing, financial planning, and with your business. Uh, the market has shown us that it always recovers and an investor should do the same thing that they do in any correction, which is don't go to cash and wait it out. Uh, no one has ever made money by going to cash and then getting back in at the right time. It's impossible to do. So the economy and the markets will take a turn when there's a decline in people affected, or if we can find out that the virus is seasonal, or if there's a vaccine or treatment or a cure is announced. Um, so I think things will turn around at that point. Um, if investors and consumers see that there's a path to health, then the economy and the markets will recover accordingly. And we think that there can be a V-shaped recovery once that happens. Ultimately, there's two potential outcomes here. Uh, number one, either the world comes to an end, which I don't think that's going to happen. And if that does happen, then everybody's money isn't worth anything anyway. Uh, or number two, this thing passes and the markets and the economy recovers. I have no strong conviction that things will get better or worse anytime soon, but I'm convinced that the latter is what will happen. And when it does, the markets and the economy will recover. And the opportunity here is for someone that's patient and disciplined. So make sure you seize that opportunity. The last thing I'll say is that the biggest benefit from all of this is I think people are coming together in a time when our country really needs it. So that's one positive to take away from this. Super. Thanks, Ben. Okay, now we're going to move on to our banking speakers. First up is uh, Dan Ambrico. He's with LSQ Contract Finance. Uh, I know that his organization does a lot with uh, the veterans group. So, Dan, uh, over to you for 60 seconds or less uh, your uh, perspective. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, what I thought I would share was just perspective on operating a small business during periods of economic dislocation. So, in my opinion, there's really three things you should focus on. Uh, the first is there's a high likelihood of seeing payments delayed, of seeing, of seeing contracts canceled. So cash flow and liquidity is obviously incredibly important to being resilient and surviving periods of you know, economic disruption. The second would be your ability to absorb fixed, fixed costs. Can you absorb a revenue decline in the short term of 20 to 25%? And where are there fixed costs in your business that you can remove? And the third being the financial health of your customers. If you're dealing directly with the government or agencies, likely your counterparty risk is not an issue. If you're dealing with contractors and prime contractors, you want to make sure you're dealing with financially healthy companies. Uh, as things move very quickly here, that, in my opinion, are the three most important ways to remain resilient. Thanks, Jennifer. All right. Thanks, Dan. Uh, next up, we've got Adam Knowles over at Atlanta Union Bank. And thanks, Adam, for joining us. Over to you. Well, Thank you, Jennifer, for putting this together. Um, at first glance, we kind of thought this would be similar to a federal government shutdown, but after you know this kind of has come out the last couple of weeks, it's it's really very different. There's kind of three common themes we we have. Kind of on one is clients that perform work on site, specifically in SCIFs, as everyone knows, is um, they're having revenue reductions as they can't work at at the client site, which is an issue. 
The other two issues that haven't happened yet, but we think will happen, one is contract shops will become more dysfunctional than normal, new contract awards will be deferred, and potentially incrementally funded contracts do not get com completed despite authorizations to proceed being issued. And the third issue we've kind of were worrying about is will payment offices have delays uh, with as they've gone to a telework site, lengthening the cash flow cycle. Uh, those are the three themes we've been discussing with our clients. Thank you. Great, thanks, Adam. Okay, now our procurement gurus, uh, Kevin Chans out of sunny South Florida. He runs the uh, Contracting Officers Podcast. If you're not listening to that, then you're missing out. Um, he's uh, also uh, heads up Skyway Acquisition Solutions. Kevin, thanks so much for joining us, and uh, your thoughts, please. Uh, so my immediate, thanks for having us. My immediate thought is this does have a lot of flashback feel to it that the pandemic part is unique, but from an acquisition as a contracting officer, I, I feel a lot of the same things I felt after 9-11 after some of the activities I deal with as special operations command. So I would say the thing I would focus on is understand what can your, your contracting officer do? Like understand what are they going through from, look, look at our part 18 that really lays out some of the things they can do right now so that you understand them so when they reach out to you and say, hey, I want to implement a letter contract, you know what's going to happen if they do that. Or they say, hey, I want you to do this at no cost. You know what your what your position is. The shortest way to do that is to look at FAR 18 and FAR 18.2 in particular. But really understand that, that that's the best way to, to help them is to bring them a solution. So when they come to you and say, I want to do this, and you go, okay, I know what that is. Let's do it. As opposed to you getting caught flat-footed and saying, well, crap, this never applied to me before. It, it, these have happened in the past. In the past, uh, a lot of these things are the FARs already, already thought about them happening. It's just that they feel different because the pandemic. This part is new, but from a from a FAR perspective, from a contracting officer perspective, a, a lot of this feels similar to, to like like Crystal said. It's a flashback to some of the things we've gone through, and let's think of it that way. And it lowers the stress level and helps us see the path forward. Great thoughts. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, last but not least, Guy Timberlake, a respected name in government contracting, uh, is the founder and chief visionary officer over at SCIF. Uh, Guy, thank you so much for joining us and your thoughts, please. Jennifer, thanks very much. And uh, folks, you're hearing a lot of great information from all the other panelists here. Uh, there's not a lot I can add relative to their opening statements. What we're seeing is unprecedented. You know, Kevin mentioned that it, it feels a lot like things that, you know, we've been through before. I've been doing this 33 years. So I've seen all the things that Kevin referred to. One of the things I want to make sure everyone understands is that the government is still open. Um, now, it may be streamlined in certain areas, but there is still work going on. And so when you think about the nature of your contract, whether it's an O&M contract or development contract, Understand how it's going to be impacted, probably similar to a continuing resolution in some in some aspects. The other part is this, though. There are people still there. And a lot of the companies that we know over the years, small, medium, and large, that say they can't get a hold of people, uh, i got a feeling it's going to be easier to get a hold of folks right now. Customers and buyers are going to be, you know, potentially at their phone or close by. This is a great opportunity to develop some relationships, expand some relationships, understand also uh, and, and I believe one of the other uh, presenters mentioned earlier about DPAS um, and the rating system. The other term you want to know is national interest action and start tracking procurements right now um, and looking at the companies that are getting that work. And as one of the other panelists mentioned, look for the healthy companies that are on these contracts and contract vehicles and keep doing business. All right. Thank you. And you are right. Government is still open. Uh, we've over the last couple of days, I've gotten some GSA uh, schedule awards, modifications, and renewals in, so uh, keep that in mind. Okay, so thanks again, panelists, for uh, keeping that short and sweet. We're now going to move on to the 41 questions. If you had sent us a question and that you don't see it here today, we are going to have the uh, panelist contact information on the last slides. You can also email us at the hello at jennifershouse.com. Okay, let's get started. So the first question that came in uh, is going to go to Mary Beth. Uh, it's understood that the impact of the COVID-19 virus on government contract performance is not compensable, but can result in changes to schedule and the avoidance of penalties. What is the process a contractor should take if their contracts are impacted and what documentation should be provided? Thanks, Jennifer. And Mary um, I think, oh, sorry. <laughs> this is very Beth Bosco. Um, I think, and we'll be talking later about this, I don't think I would assume that the impacts on performance are not compensable. Um, we'll get into that later. In terms of your delays, 
um, the remember to notify your contracting officer. You know, you might want to put in a letter today. Obviously, they know that you're being delayed, but some some folks are very strict on notice requirements. And then you want to document, document, document. So set up new charge uh, codes um, and put all the costs, the extra costs that are occasioned by the delay uh, into that um, bucket, if you will. And um, just keep track of everything that you are doing. You also should make an effort, if you can, to mitigate the cost and the delay. Because when you go back to the government and seek either a contract um, modification, which may carry with it both a schedule adjustment and, and possibly compensation, um, you will have all the information that you need. And you would, you know, you may not be in um, as good a position as you would have been in had the virus not happened, but you'll be in as good a position as you possibly can be. Great, thank you. And number two, can you please clarify that COVID-19 is considered an epidemic in accordance with FAR 52.294-14 excusable delays clause? Margaret? Thanks, Jennifer. So under the um, so under any delay, not just excusable delay, but any any delay, the word epidemic is used in the FAR as an example. It's it's in there for other with other examples as well. So whether it is officially considered um, a epidemic as as given some legal definition is almost of no moment. What the moment is, and what matters is whether or not the government and your contracting officer and legal authorities can agree that something has happened that is completely beyond your control and that something that happened that is beyond your control has impacted your ability to perform your contract. And so that is ultimately going to be the question rather than whether COVID-19 is defined as an epidemic or not. Have you encountered something that's beyond your control that impacts the delivery of the goods or services you're providing. And as Mary Beth said, if the answer to that is yes, and for many of you that answer is going to be yes, then, you, then look out into your world to see if there's a way to mitigate that. So for example, if you're a consultant and you're able to have your people work from home, you have now just mitigated something that's beyond your control. So it's going to be a very factual determination between you and your contracting officer about the impact COVID-19 is gonna have on your contract and what can be done about it. Great, thank you. And how should federal contractors manage their cash conversion cycle? Yeah, so maybe quickly what the cash conversion cycle is. You know, typically when you're dealing with government and government work, your payment cycle, your receivable will get paid, you know, probably in best case 60 days, more likely 90 or 120 days. And it's very important from a working capital standpoint to make sure that your payments to suppliers, whether they be subcontractors or other suppliers, line up with how quickly you're getting paid by the government or the agency. So you want to manage your cash conversion cycle, which is simply just thinking about your DSO, 120 days, and your DPO. And so quite simply, you want to make sure you're paying your suppliers and subs as slowly as you're getting paid from the government, and likely payment terms will be more challenging as there's disruption to business going forward. So it's very important from a liquidity standpoint. Thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, number four, how could this affect existing RFPs, requests for proposals that are in final decision post oral presentation? Kevin, please. Well, I'm gonna go with uh, the path of least resistance. Um, the, if they're mission critical, we'll, we'll get them done. I mean, that's, that it's, I'm going back to my, my flashback mindset. Um, if it's something that is a nice to have and it's not a final contract yet, all I have to do is say, hey, is your proposal good for 90 days? I'm oversimplifying, I get that. But to say, it, your, your proposal is good for 90 more days, we're gonna punt this and catch up. Or same thing with some of the RFPs that come out. If the, if the RFP is out, we're gonna ask, can, can you uh, understand we're gonna extend this for 90 days, you have 90 more days or 30 days, something to submit your, your proposal. So I'm gonna go with path of least resistance on the things that are non-mission critical. And one of the things I foot stomp a lot is targeting. You should know on your target agencies what's critical versus what's the, like training is honestly very rarely a critical thing. Sometimes it is, but not always, right? So if you're a training company, 
expect that they're going to push those RFPs out. And the easy way to do that, which takes one post, please uh, keep your proposals good for 90 days. We're going to finish this source selection when we have time. Right? I'm oversimplifying. So yeah, I, I think the, the big difference here is, is it going to be a mission critical impact? And make sure that you target your agencies well enough to, to know is your, what you're doing mission critical because they're going to get it done. It's going to be nights and weekends. They're going to be calling you saying, hey, can you update this overnight? Those things will get done, but the stuff that's not mission critical, the things that are halfway through uh, will sit. Uh, also, the things that aren't in RFP yet, I got to tell you, I'm going to sole source them. I'm going to find a way under, for, again, for our 18.2, because to put them through the crucible of the RFP process when I don't have to, I'm not going down that road. I'm much more likely to find a way to sole source it, even if it means extending the existing contract or doing a, a bridge for, I don't know, two years to give myself the runway. Because you can hear the tension in my voice living through and remembering some of these things. I need to find bands, I need to find white space in my schedule. And the easiest way is to, to do sole source contracts that I just got a whole bunch of extra authority to do. Right, thank you. Uh, so expectations for redistributing of agency funding that could have been allocated for specific RFPs that are not mission critical, Guy? Yeah, I mean, so I'm gonna play off of what Kevin was just you know talking about also. I mean, it's gonna come down to, um, you know, what is mission, what's not mission, um, and so from a funding standpoint, if there are dollars out there that are, you know, not yet obligated or even in some cases potentially obligated because they can always reverse that, um, I think there's a high likelihood that anything that falls under, uh, again, the NIA, the National Interest Action, uh, or has a defense priority rating, um, that, that money could get pulled uh, in light of uh, fulfilling those things that are going to hopefully be used to mitigate um situations whether it's the army corps or dea or someone like that working on something that's got to get done today great thank you and number six what are some some of the ways in which businesses can exchange with congress about the specific impact of covid19 on our businesses and establish channels for feedback on how well the implementation process at the relevant agencies are going dl Yes, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, as you heard me say in the opening, I, I think it is very important for uh, contractors, for small businesses to have their voices heard under any circumstances when legislation is being passed, but particularly during an emergency situation like this. Uh, members, many members have already hosted sort of review sessions of the current, the three big packages. You heard from my colleague earlier that there's probably 50 or so packages moving around, but it's important that when these packages are shaped, that you talk to your, your member. Hopefully they know you before uh, something like this hits and you've done a little bit of time to introduce yourself, your business, how many people you employ in the district. All of these things are extremely important uh, as a general rule for, for public affairs, government relations, but particularly in times of, of crisis. So if, you, if, if your member of Congress is hosting these calls, I would urge you to get on them. There's a Q's and A session where members ask for feedback on, on specific ideas in legislation. And, you know, you should not just be a industry sector. You should be a specific company and speak about how it is going to impact you very specifically. Now, with respect to uh, how things are going to be implemented, we have three packages, two that have become law. Which we'll talk about those later. But, uh, but all of these uh, bills uh, we'll have an oversight provision once things go into the agencies and things start to get implemented. Uh, Congress will want to see how the administration uh, is spending uh, that money with respect to the ways in which the, the packages uh, were passed out of, out of Congress. So you want to be in a process to be able to explain to your member how well this has worked for you. Look, you know, a lot of these packages take months to, to craft and they're still imperfect. Certainly, these are not going to, when they meet with fresh air, uh, be uh, perform as well as we hope when they're on paper. So you want to be prepared to, to give your member uh, feedback on how these specific proposals are impacting you specifically. Thanks. And will the federal government modify payment terms to expedite payments as quickly as weekly to infuse cash into small businesses to meet payroll and other processing needs. Mary Beth? Unfortunately, I think the answer to that is, at least at this point, um, it's going to be contract by contract, um, the decision of individual contracting officers. 
um, to just pick up on the notion of making sure your Congress folks are aware of, um, you know, the sort of outsized impact of all this on small businesses, you should be perhaps working with some of the, you know, big contracting uh, trade associations to get that notion across that it would be great to have included in one of the upcoming pieces of lit litigate, uh, legislation um, some type of a requirement to speed payment to small businesses. But until that um, either is issued, say, uh, by the Office of Management and Budget or Congress puts it in one of the pieces of legislation, you're going to have to rely on your contracting officers. And what guidance can we expect to have from the government, Margaret? Hi, hi, Jennifer. I think the bottom line at this point, at least, is I don't think you should wait for the Calvary. I think you need to go out into the world and get your own guidance, um, especially if you're dealing with agencies like DOD, HHS, and some of those agencies um, that are on the front lines. With that said, I think it'll start depending on the agency. It'll depend on your contracting officer um, for when guidance starts flowing and what that guidance will look like. Additionally, um, reach out to resources. Each reach out to your to your uh, prime contractors, to your subcontractors. If you feel that they may have knowledge and you find them to be trustworthy, work well with them. Um, reach out to the SBA. Reach out to PTAC. Reach out to the folks on this call and and start building up and in, in, in taking your own counsel as you move forward. Thanks. And if we don't get paid, what resources are there for small gov government contractors to cover the shortfalls, Matt? Uh, thanks. I, I, as a as a financial advisor uh, who used to work on the banking side, I always have people ask me about their their banking relationships. And so, while I can't talk about public funding, um, talking about uh, private funding, I always say the same thing to people when they ask me about their banking relationships, and that's to find uh, a community bank that is the most convenient to them, either uh, through their workplace or their home, and develop a relationship with the banker there. Um, and the smaller the bank, the more flexible they can be. And we all know that at this time, we need as much flexibility as we possibly can. Uh, and so for people who are looking for uh, sources of, of funds with some flexibility uh, at it, I would look for the, the smallest bank that's convenient for you and, and develop that relationship. And uh, at the end of this, you'll probably come out with a much stronger relationship with a banker than you, you did previously. Thanks. And uh, what can we expect to happen to solicitations that are expected to drop this month or next month? Kevin? No, I'm back to my same answer of is this, if it's not mission critical, I'm thinking that they're not going to drop. Uh, because if I look, if again, put yourself in the seat of the contracting officer. I have work that I don't know that I have yet. Well, if I'm signing up to manage a source selection over the next, you know, 30 days, 60 days, five months, whatever, I'm not going to put that work in my pipeline if I already have more work than I know what to do with. So... I would expect that either they're going to extend them or in some cases, going back to some of the points made here about reallocation of funds, they may cancel them because they're not going to have the money to pay for that thing or they don't know they're going to have it and they can always resolicit it later. So I would expect that most of the things that haven't dropped yet, unless they're mission critical, I would pull them off the plate, which is going to frustrate a lot of people. That's going to impact a lot of cash flow and a lot of planning. Uh, but yeah, it, it, reach out to your contracting officer, reach out to the folks that you've built relationships with and, and read the tea leaves and, and how important it is to that agency to figure this out. But more often than not, I think it's at least going to get punted if not canceled. Great, thanks. And what's the defense priorities and allocation system and how does it work, Mary Beth? Um, yeah, so I'm sure you've been hearing about uh, this in the news. Um, uh, it can be, um, it doesn't really have to be invoked by the president. I think there's some confusion about different parts of different statutes. So the Defense prior Priorities and Allocation System, or DPAS, is a way of rating government contracts um, and making them have priority over a company's other um, uh, commercial, let's say, or even other agency obligations. So um, a contract, uh, you'll see on the front page of contracts, if it is DPAS rated, you will see that box is checked, which is why it's important for everybody to check their DOD contract to see if um, 
they could be subject to this. And the, uh, if you are DPOS rated, then the contracting officer can come and say, look, I need you to supply me, you know, X number of product by next week and you are obligated to basically drop everything and get that done. Now contractors can um, decline a, a, a DPAS order if they if uh, they really think they can't do it, but um, if you pick one up then you are bound to make that your priority. Um, quickly though, other agencies have a similar um, uh, authority. For example, um, uh, GSA has uh, sort of an emergency procurement uh, authority and they have, um, uh, you know, they can do the same thing to non-DOD contracts. So you may even see some things on the supply schedule get um, bumped up. So watch out for that. Watch out. Make sure you know what your contracts say about that. Great, thanks. And number 12, are we allowed to contact contract officers or specialists, Guy? So the first thing is, if you are currently on contract, absolutely. I mean, anything going on right now relative to contract performance, delivery, all the above, should be a conversation with your administrative contracting officer. Um, if you are not under contract and you're simply trying to get information about things going on, I would just say measure those conversations. Um, while it's a great time to go out and develop relationships or expand those relationships, if you're calling in for stuff that's somewhat insignificant in the scheme of things, um, that probably won't be viewed as uh, productive or favorable. But again, if you're already on contract, absolutely, that's who you should be talking to with some consistency, quite honestly. Great, thank you. And number 13, will federal government contingency plans for contracts and grants be implemented as they did during the 2019 shutdown? Crystal? Um, currently, the White House Office of Management and Budget, their agency contingency plan website does not have information on contingency plans for COVID-19. Um, but I found out yesterday is that Senator Warner and seven of his colleagues sent a letter to the acting directors of the Office of Management and Budget and the Office of Personnel Management, basically telling them that they need to provide this information on contingency plans and put it in a central place online so it can be readily available to everyone because everyone wants to know exactly what the federal government is going to do in relation to federal contracts and grants. Great, thanks. And 14, for positions that can be done via telework, can we request government to allow for uh, duty modification? And how would we go about this? Kevin? Well, the short answer is yes. Uh, there are clauses in some contracts that deal with this, although they call it telework, not uh, work from home. So it's that, that term telework is a little bit dated, as are the clauses. So going back to Guy's point, you have a contract with the government, contact them as soon as possible with this is our plan. Uh, one of the recommendations we're making is in the event you can't do all of the work that is required by your contract, but you can do more of the work that is a smaller piece, Make, but you can do it remotely, right? So let's say that part of your contract is, is is building plans for, ironically, for contingency operations, right? But that's that's 5% of the contract. 90% was stuff you had to do in the building. Well, what if you switch those out? And again, you come to the contracting officer and to the customer with a plan to say, okay, we're going to increase the part that we can do from home and shrink the part we can't do from home, but the value to the government is the same or it's close enough that I as a contracting officer can say, okay, this is a, this is a fair trade. We do a mod and the, the, they were within scope. We're just modifying for certain circumstances and we go on our merry way. So that's what I would suggest is look for things that you can do more of that weren't in, in you know, the old days, two weeks ago, weren't planned to be a big part of your contract, but you can do them remotely. And maybe, you're, maybe you maybe you speed up, the, you accelerate the schedule on certain parts of your contract because it's stuff you're planning to do over the next year, but it's stuff you can do remotely. So be creative about that. But the, the, the big message here, is bring that solution to the government as opposed to saying, what do you want me to do? Because they're already overwhelmed with the number of decisions they have to make. And I, I think I said earlier that one of the things I'm worried about as a contracting officer, I'm, I'm afraid of making the wrong decision, particularly at scale. If I make the wrong decision in four or five of my contracts, and then six months from now, it's going to create work for people or pick a, pick a bad outcome, that's what you want to have happen. So bring them a solution that they can just go, you know what, that's not a bad idea, and move. Focus on doing that. 
Great, thank you. 15, what uh, financial products are available for federal contractors in the marketplace? Dan? Yes, so there are three that I would focus on. Um, the first would be sort of an SBA loan. Um, the good thing about SBA loans is you don't need a lot of business history. Oftentimes, there's a relative amount of flexibility uh, and a relatively low cost. Uh, the problem is oftentimes they lack capacity, so there's only a limited number from a size standpoint. Uh, you can think about financing the accounts receivable or an asset-based loan where you're using your government invoices as collateral, much more flexible, can move quicker, higher cost than an SBA or bank line. Uh, and the third, you know, I think viable option is to get a bank line of credit. Longest underwriting process may take time, has a low amount of, you know, also can be somewhat restrictive, but does come with a really low cost. An option to avoid would be a short-term cash advance type product. By far the most simple, but also the most expensive and likely a drain on your long-term cash flow and balance sheet. So those to me are the most viable options. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Uh, what should we do if we do not receive a stop work order at the core in telling us to stay home? Mary Beth? Sure. Um, again, I, I know you guys are sick of hearing this, but it's uh, communicate with your contracting officer. Um, unfortunately, if your state is saying, you know, stay home, and you've got a federal government contract, the federal requirements sort of trump the state requirements, actually. Um, but you obviously don't want to be breaking, you know, the law or ordinances in your jurisdiction. So this is another one where you should ask for a stop work order or, you know, picking up with what Kevin said, you should um, figure out how much you can do under the contract and approach your contracting officer uh, with a solution. Great. Thank you. And number 17, can you provide a list of the current legislation funding packages being proposed or already in existence that might apply to federal contractors? Quick overview presentation on the primary ones would be helpful, including which government agencies will be administering the funding, where to track the opportunities, and when applications are expected to be due. DL. Thank you, Jennifer. On the last part, I will just echo Mary Beth, and, and that is, you know, check with your contract officers on uh, where where these opportunities are and when applications will be due. But we're a long ways from uh, most of these things getting implementing guidelines from the agency. So in the meantime, let's, let's look at uh, the big three, as I call it. Uh, my colleague, Crystal, uh, mentioned earlier that there's several coronavirus packages and, and pieces of legislation uh, in the pipeline. But uh, there's three big ones that we've been hearing about, and I'd just like to touch uh, touch on on those three, if, if, if I will. So there's been three rounds, uh, two that began in the House, and they are law now, which uh, for Washington, D.C., I can tell you <laughs> that's unprecedented in terms of the time. So it shows the scale of the crisis that we're facing that we we're able to get uh, two uh, uh, bills introduced into the House, uh, voted on, approved, sent to the Senate, approved, and then signed by the President. Uh, round one was the Coronavirus uh, Preparedness and uh, Response Supplemental uh, Appropriations Act. This bill was largely to try and solidify what we know were the weaknesses in, in, the, in the health system. So we had about $3.4 for public health and social services, uh, 2.2 billion so for centers for disease control, uh, National Institutes of Health got 836 million, uh, and for the people on the call, uh, the most important thing uh, was that 7 billion uh, was was allocated uh, for small businesses uh, in, in what they call is disaster uh, loans uh, category. Uh, State Department also got some money and USAID uh, those budgets were already uh, quite slim, so this is a blessing, but most of that money went to uh, evacuation. Uh, you would have seen some of that happen in our uh, consulates in Wuhan and, and other places, uh, and also uh, for additional humanitarian and health assistance. The second uh, round, the Coronavirus Response Act, uh, which passed almost as quickly as the first round, uh, really dealt with the, the various paid leave schemes uh, that have been discussed. So 
It created an emergency paid leave program to respond to the outbreak. Uh, and there are some specifics there which, which we can get into. Uh, most of that for businesses uh, would be financed through uh, tax, uh, tax credits. <clears throat> Those two pieces of, of legislation, as I mentioned, are passed and they are law now, and we're waiting for uh, implementation guidelines on those. There's a third round uh, that is actually currently being negotiated as we speak, and that uh, is the so-called stimulus package or the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act um, raised in the Senate, being discussed now. This one, I think, will have some uh, problems with quick passage because the House has bigger ideas than, than what is present here. But as it exists in its current form, there's sort of four major categories, uh, the direct assistance to America, to Americans, more relief for small business, uh, and uh, to bolster the health system uh, here in the country. This is the famous $1,200 cash payments uh, for Americans making up to 75K or so. So a lot of complexity in these things. We can't cover it all on the phone, but uh, there are a number of people on the call who can really help you drill down on how this specifically relates uh, to the people on the call. Great. Thanks, DL. Uh, number 18, can you speak to firm fixed contracts in this environment if people are not working but the contract is fixed price? Margaret? Thanks, Thanks Jennifer. On, for, on your firm fixed price contract, you need to deliver what you promised that you're that what you promised you would deliver in your contract. Now, if you can do if you can deliver what what you promised with five people rather than ten people, um, generally speaking, you can still continue to perform and can still continue to get paid. It is an issue once your delivery becomes impacted. Um, however, I'm going to reiterate what the others on this call have said. If you have people that are not working um, and you think you're not going to make your delivery schedule or turn into the government what they're expecting, you need to let the contracting officer know that as soon as possible because it is one of those situations where you're facing something that is completely out of your control. So it depends on what your situation is when it comes to the fixed price, fixed price contract. Can you continue performance or not? And if the answer to that is or not, then you need to start working with your contracting officer on what you're going to do with that fixed price contract. And if you do get in a situation where the contract is going to be terminated by the government, then essentially that contract from fixed price contract turns into almost a cost reimbursement. Um, and you need to be able to show the government the cost that you've incurred in performance to date. For the work that you performed to date, you will be able to get some sort of profit. But your settlement costs to close down that contract um, will not afford you the right to include some sort of profit. It will be just the cost of what it is to close out that contract and to, to sort of turn it off. That's why when Mary Beth tells you to document your cost, that's what she's talking about, so that you can be sure to show the government, this is the cost of what I've incurred so far in performance, even though it was fixed price. And these are the costs that I've incurred in trying to close or stop this contract. That's kind of the answer on fixed price contracts. Thank you. And number 19, what can I do and what can my employees do for themselves to keep our personal individual investments safe at this time, Matt? Sorry, it took me a minute to uh, take myself off, off mute there. Um, to keep everything uh, safe, it's like what I said before, is to stay invested. I wouldn't make any changes based on the market. Um, I would only make changes if your goals have changed. Uh, talk to your financial advisor, your your financial planner, uh, about what what he or she thinks about the market and how it how it might affect you and what you should do. Thank you. Thanks. And is it your opinion that certain SBA activities, for example, socioeconomic classification and program approvals, will slow down to meet the demands of the new stimulus requirement, Mary Beth? Uh, I think the answer to that is, unfortunately, yes. Um, you know, the SBA is often slow to act. You have um, shortage of, you know, a little bit of a knowledge shortage over at SBA. Um, as uh, people who've been there a long time either retire or go someplace else. And on top of that now, you have placed um, this uncertainty. So I think, yes, everything is going to take longer than it ordinarily takes, including 
the classification and program approvals. Great, thanks. Now we're about the uh, halfway mark here. Uh, summer 21, what is the National Interest Action and what does it mean? Guy, over to you. Okay, thanks. So I'm gonna first start by saying to Mary Beth, thank you very much. And DL, thank you very much for teeing me up for this question. Had no idea you guys were gonna do that for me. And to Kevin, I'm gonna owe you a beer because I'm gonna eke into your next question also just a little bit. So in a National Interest Action, you've heard Mary Beth talk about DPAS. Well, DPAS is the result contractually of national interest activities by the US government. So a national interest action is the type of thing that DL described. The funding bills that just came through where the State Department and USAID got money for evacuations and uh, humanitarian support, those are considered national interest actions. Anything that requires an emergency response or contingency response from the US government. And when that happens, the government has certain things that it can do and usually will do, and that will include changing the way it does procurements. And so one of the ways that a lot of contractors will see that is things like the micro purchase threshold go from the 10,000 to a million, or see simplified acquisitions, FAR Part 13, go from a quarter million to either seven or 13 million. So the national interest action is something that you can track if you've ever gone to the Federal Procurement Data System Next Generation. You'll see these listed on the home page: Hurricane Michael, Hurricane Katrina, uh, COVID-19 is the latest one, obviously. Um, and these are things that you can actually anticipate activity from the government on um, in action, such as legislative, but also in procurement. So if you go to FPDS right now and type in P20C as a national interest action code, you can track all the procurements that have occurred since March 13th, tied to COVID-19. Right, thanks, Guy. Uh, number 22, um, Kim, we're gonna go back to you for this. Uh, what specific tools can the contracting officer use to award contracts under emergency situations? So uh, I, I'll pick on the hot ones. Obviously, there's an unusual compelling urgency, uh, which is you know, far part six, but there are also things like not even having to put something out for notice. Uh, you can skip a lot of the steps in far, 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 far part five. Uh, and the the really fun part is, again, go through far part 18. The first part, like 80% of far part 18 lists, here are the things that already exist in the FAR that the contracting officers can already use, regard, like they're situational. Like just because there isn't, it doesn't have to be a national emergency to use unusual compelling as long as you justify it to, at the contract level. A lot of this already, already existed. You'll see more of it. But you'll also see the types of things they can do as far as the, the threat, like, like Guy was saying, the thresholds are going to increase, et cetera. What's a little bit different is FAR 18.2 talks about, okay, well, if we actually have a national declaration of an emergency, here are a few other things that kick in. And the nuance of those is going to change over time. But I would say, rather than me read them off to you, just Google or go to, go to acquisition.gov and click on the little 18, and it literally lists them. There's 27 scenarios. And those are the kind of things that if you know what they are, when you're you can bring them to your contracting officer and say, hey, you can use this to, to, to modify my contract, or even better, when they bring it to you, you, you don't get caught flat-footed. Super, and just as a quick uh, commercial break here, uh, we have decided in uh, starting January 1st of this year, 2020, on every Friday at 12 o'clock, we are covering each part of the FAR in a complimentary webinar series. So today at 12 o'clock, we just finished up FAR part 12, I think it was. So in a couple more weeks, we will get into FAR Part 18. So we go chronological, that schedule's on our website. Um, and can I jump in real okay. fast? We're, hey, we're also putting out an episode to help with this problem. Uh, we're doing an episode on the podcast uh, that comes out on Monday covering specifically FAR Part 18. So that will help too. Over to you for this one. Should federal contractors react differently from other investors in this market volatility due to their reliance on the federal government for contracts and funding? Yeah, I, I don't really see any reason to need to react differently than other investors or business owners during this time. Uh, you know, the federal government needs many contractors to provide support and services, and they're riding the ups and downs like most other businesses. But, you know, the economy is really simple. People want stuff and they need stuff, and the government needs contractors to deliver that. And as long as people want stuff, there's going to be people that need to create companies to deliver that. So supply and demand with corrections can get off course, and that often can come from a lack of demand. Um, but that can be corrected in time. So right now, less people are going to the movie theater, less people are going to Chipotle, less people are going to games and concerts. This impacts the economy. Will people do that a year from now? 
uh, when this passes? Of course they will. So this is just something we need to ride out until then. And all businesses, including federal contractors, need to be more nimble, creative during this time. They need to identify problems and solutions quickly uh, to solve those for other people that others can't. In the short term, uh, you know, like was mentioned earlier, there is the new SPA loan program, uh, the Disaster Relief Fund, where you can apply for up to two million dollars of of funding for up to 30 years. There's very generous terms, you know, three percent interest rates or so. It's so very generous. You know, a company or contractor in which revenue is stopped to utilize this. Um, the important thing is you got to calculate your economic injury appropriately so you can get your your application in in quickly, which could take one to three weeks if it's done right. The request has to be done right. But you know, there could be thousands of loans that go through here with bottlenecks. But if you if you propose it rightly, it could go through quickly. And lastly, um, tax extension filing deadlines have been delayed to 7:15 July 15th, a 90-day extension. So it's basically an interest-free loan to pay your taxes. Uh, this can also help you with short-term cash flow. Great advice. Thanks, Ben. Uh, number 24, if the federal government, such as uh, CDC, NIH, et cetera, orders from suppliers, does that legally become a priority preference to other entities' orders, including the government? Margaret? Thanks, Jennifer. So, so two things. Um, as, as Kevin's already mentioned, FAR Part 18.2, gives the government some um, ability to um, place orders and to expedite orders and expedite the contracting processing using different different tools to do so. And as Mary Beth mentioned, there's the uh, DPAS orders as well, which give some sort of priority preference to certain supplies and services once the contract is so marked. However, what you need to look at is what and, and talk with your contracting officer about is your contract going to come out and tell you that you have to that you're in a situation where you're going to have to give the government's or the government's um, request for supplies or services preference over other entities or over other government programs where the government is not in a position telling you telling you that um, your supplies or your services are now a preference and must be delivered on a certain schedule. Great. Thanks. And number 25, the SBA's disaster relief website is in the latest PTAC email, does not list vast numbers of states and areas within those states that have obviously been affected by COVID-19. How frequently is the website being updated? How will we know if our work locations are covered by the disaster relief program, if not currently identified in the SBA website? Uh, and we do have that website on the, uh, the front slide. Uh, or is it nationwide, regardless of state or location? Mary Beth? Um, it, it unfortunately is not nationwide. In order to be um, eligible for this loan program, you have to be in a state that um, has been designated by the SBA. Um, they, so the, you've got, you have to be proactive. You're just going to have to go to their website um, every day and check if you are not already in a state that has been designated as eligible for the relief program. Uh, the other thing you might want to do is, you know, see if your states are doing anything. Um, I think Florida has some bridge loans for small businesses. Um, other states may also be pushing, either pushing through some legislation to help their small businesses or already have something on the books. So check uh, with your PTAC, um, uh, you know, periodically to see if they've gotten any new information in. Great. And for those that aren't aware, the PTAC, uh, PTAC, Procurement Technical Assistance Center, there is one in every state. Uh, if you don't know, uh, where yours is or how to contact, uh, go to Dr. Google and put in PTAC and the, uh, the name of the state that you live in. Okay, uh, 26, what are the recommendations if the government doesn't allow the contractors to telework? Adam? Yes, yeah, so I think Kevin touched on some of this earlier about can, can you shift part of the work to be cle completed on the contract, uh, part of the projects that some of the work that pops through the home. I've talked to some of their clients. I know they'll do some research work or other work for, for the client, but there's really no no kind of silver bullet to this answer. You need to talk to your, your prime if you're sub, or the K or the COTAR, um, but this is kind of where you're forced to make a tough decision about uh, having employees take PTO or going negative on PTO. But I do think long-term, it's important to think the government doesn't want to hurt the industrial base that supports them, so it, it will be painful, I think, in the time being, but they are going to want to work with you to come up with solutions, but there's no silver bullet to this answer. 
27, this is going to be a two-part question or two-slide question. In the televised uh, presidential COVID update on uh, March 17th, Secretary Mnuchin stated that the government's, which I assume is SBA's disaster relief program, will cover small and medium-sized businesses with less than 500 personnel. A uh, question I have is, does his statement indicate that they are somehow redefining what businesses can receive economic relief because there is no definition in SBA for a uh, quote, medium-sized company. And number two, small businesses are defined by NAICS codes, which can be based on the number of personnel or the annual number of receipts. Please clarify what a medium-sized company is and if they qualify for relief or only or are only small businesses based on their primary NAICS code eligible for relief. Kevin? So the short answer is no, there is no, as of now, there's no mid-sized company. Uh, and the reason I offered to answer this question, I, we did an episode, I think it was episode 99 a couple of years ago, and it was called the mid-sized government contractor. It was, and it was kind of a, a play on the fact if you're a, if you're a small, large business who just outgrew your NAICS code, or if you're a large, small business, there's two different ways to, for, for the government to understand how to use you. I think what, what's important here is to understand a lot of folks who are speaking at that level it's going over their heads. Like they pick 500 as a as an average number, but they're not thinking in terms of well that affects this particular type of professional services. I mean we're we have to th take this with a you know think a, in a scale factor. These are the kind of things as a contracting officer when I say okay we're going to help small businesses, I'm afraid to say that out loud because then some people say well I'm a small business and I have 500 employees. I'm a small business and I have 1,500 employees. I'm a small business and I have 50 employees. All these new questions come in. So don't get hung up at that level. Again, what, what are you, right? Understand there is no such thing as a medium small, size small business. And if you have left, if you have over 500 employees, then the question becomes, okay, I'm still a small business. I'm a manufacturer, for example, with 500 employees. Go to your contracting officer, if, it, if it's appropriate, or to your small business specialist, or, or for that matter, read the laws, as a couple of folks have talked about here, and see if it applies to you. But don't get hung up on that medium term, because that, that is a marketing term. That is, you know, we target medium-sized businesses, but the government doesn't really have something like that, that I know of, that I've, I've looked. Um, and like I said, we, we made a podcast about that to see what would happen. And we got a lot of questions like this. It doesn't actually exist. So just be aware. Great. And number 28 is also a, a two-parter here. So bear with me as I uh, plow through this. If a federal construction project is suspended due to this COVID-19 pandemic, we are being informed that we may only be entitled to time extension, force majeure, and not money. This does nothing to help companies financially and will result in both unexpected and unforeseen additional direct and indirect costs relative to demobilization, remobilization, and procurement, et cetera. These severe economic impacts will likely significantly harm many companies within contract supply chains, and many of the small subcontractors may not even survive to be able to return to finish their work. It is that critical. Based on the massive nature of this global pandemic and the resultant significant impact to the world, economies, and supply chains, we can only hope that senior DOD and government officials will implement fair and reasonable leg legislation and policy directives that will provide uh, demonstrable relief to all such companies like mine that have committed our entire mission to enhance the mission readiness of our bases and their facilities while improving the quality of lives of our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines. Please elaborate on how firms can receive equitable monetary relief should our projects be suspended. Mary Beth? Sure, thank you. Um, you are correct in that the excusable delay clause, which is the one that most people are gonna have to rely on, uh, only uh, provides for a change in schedule. It does not provide for monetary relief. However, having said that, I think what contractors will do is characterize this as a change to their contract and um, try and increase, uh, you know, get a modification to the contract to increase funding to cover the cost of mobilization, demobilization, et cetera. Um, you should, uh, again, if you're going to do that, it's the documentation of all your costs. And also, if you can, you know, in order to get paid, the government's going to say, well, what did you do to help yourself? So can you move employees uh, to other work? Um, if you've got to get rid of your, you know, I hate to say this, lay off your employees during this period, what you need to be able to show the government to, is to say, um, look, we, we needed to keep these people on, 
Um, we needed to keep them on the payroll. Um, and we want compensation for that because it would be impossible to get them back once the company was re-upped, once the contract was re-upped. So, for example, people with uh, security clearances, if you let them go, you may never be able to get them back. So, um, uh, you know, those are some thoughts in terms of sort of an across-the-board response. I think that's going to have to come from Congress. And um, as you've heard, there are there's more relief in this third tranche of COVID uh, relief legislation. So we'll have to tune in and watch that. Um, and again, you know, go to the Professional Services Association, the different contractor trade groups, because they'll be monitor monitoring all these situations very closely. Great ideas. Thanks, Mary Beth. Uh, and Margaret, over to you for this one. If we have a firm fixed price contract, do we still get paid or can the government modify the contract at their discretion? Jennifer, generally speaking, the government can modify the contract or they can cancel the contract as well. But as, as we've already discussed, if something like that does happen, there are ways to work with the, with the government on um, getting a, a profit for the work that you perform to getting your settlement costs. Um, in that type of a situation. And just to reiterate again, it, talking with your contracting officer is important um, in this time to understand where you are on delivery and where they are on their funding and where they are on their plans with your contracts, especially if they're not an imperative um, sort of service or supply that you are delivering to the government. Thanks. And number 30, what should I be asking my lender when having discussions with them? Adam? I think it's the best thing is kind of have a when you call call your lender have kind of build out before your call some sort of uh, financial model that kind of shows what happens with the different scenarios with your business what it looks like with each scenario if you lose revenue what your cash flow looks like most clients I kind of recommend building out a weekly cash flow so when you call your lender you can talk to them about what the situation is and what the ask is instead of just calling and saying, this is the issue, how do I solve it? Start collaborating with your lender about what the plan looks like so you can have a realistic discussion about how they can help and what they can do to help with your cash flow situation. Great, thanks. And 31, what do you suggest for new business development with agencies we have no relationships with? How to get in front of potential buyers, how to establish new relationships to generate new sales in fiscal year 20. Matt? I would say to first double down on your current contact management strategy with your current clients um, with a, a strategy of staying in close communication with them. A lot of people have talked about the kind of renewed importance of uh, communicating with your current clients. And so doubling down on your communication strategy with them to make sure that those lines of communication are open and that's going both ways. Uh, and then uh, from that, uh, launching into the, the people that they can introduce you to uh, by doubling down on your, your best clients so that uh, when you go into fiscal year 22, you're go, uh, 2020, you're going in, into the, from a position uh, of strength. <clears throat> Obviously, everybody is, is scrambling. Everybody's kind of in a, a mode of trying to get a handle on everything right now. Uh, cold calling people isn't going to be a, particularly a, a great strategy right now but uh, doubling down on your best clients so that you're not just replicating any new clients, you are replicating your best clients so that your portfolio of your best clients uh, and your best relationships ca continue uh, to expand. And then those people that you have been, been talking to over the years and you have a good relationship with them, but there's never been a chance for you to do a contract with them or, or do do something with them as long as you continue to uh, be in contact with them and continue that positive relationship with them as always even not in a time of crisis but things change eventually something changes and eventually their exact need meets your exact solution and then that will that will link up and continues to stay in contact with them and um, uh, the crisis that we'll experience will just speed up that process so that you will be perfectly matched with those people that you've been talking to maybe even for years all of a sudden you are perfectly matched each other and you can do business and you can help them thank you 
Great. And I'm going to actually uh, interject here and build on what uh, Matt just said with some more tactical um, suggestions. I think using the OSDABUs and the OSBPs, so the OSDABUs are the Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilizations in the civilian agencies, and the OSBPs, the Office of Small Business Programs in the Defense Agencies. Uh, they're obviously the advocates for small businesses. Uh, you want to go to them and leverage them uh, when you have an opportunity that you've identified and you need some uh, extra muscle, um, perhaps, in getting in, in touch with the right people. Uh, I'd also suggest going to FPDS, Federal Procurement Data System .gov, doing some market research there, some reverse engineering to find out who's got the contracts with the agency you're trying to penetrate. Uh, looking at, this is all publicly available free data, the top 100 vendors. Uh, within the department, there's going to be the top um, prime contractors. Then uh, you can take their um, their company name, uh, plug that into FPDS, find out what contracts they have, where you could be a subcontractor to them. Don't contact them until you've gone into their website, registered as a small business, customize the capability statement specifically for them, but specifically for an opportunity as well. Okay, and let's move on to 32. Uh, my understanding of non-stop work orders is we can do an REA for costs associated with shutting down and restarting the work, but can I include contractor salaries during this time if I have to keep paying them? Mary Beth? Um, the answer is um, maybe, um, and it depends, which are typical horrible lawyer answers. Um, you're going to have to show that it was necessary to keep the employees on and that you could not assign them to, uh, let's just say, another project. So as I said before, some, uh, there are some workers, employees, that um, are, uh, you know, really irreplaceable um, or it would take a long time to replace them if you let them go. So the argument is um, to support the mission, we needed to keep these employees on because if we let them go, um, we would not be able to start up again once you told us to start up or it would take us um, far too long to do that. So those are the two things that you really need to show and think about. 33, uh, if the government closes an installation and then suspends the contract that we are working on based on a policy decision to presumably minimize the potential for future potential cases and not based on any direct or actual cases of COVID-19 infection, does the FAR clause for force majeure apply? Please explain why a firm would not be eligible for fair and reasonable financial relief. Margaret? Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, so, so on the first part of the question. I think we're in a state where the federal government has declared an emergency and most of the states at this point have declared an emergency as a result of COVID-19. So I think the first part of the question um, suggests a situation where we might not be operating in an emergency declaration situation. So I think that if, if a base is closed or contracts are stopped because of COVID-19, I think you are in a force majeure situation because of the emergency declaration um, itself. As far as why a firm would not be eligible, I think I think Mary Beth just described that very well. It, it will depend on, on what you're performing, um, the supplies you're delivering, you know, what your labor looks like on that contract and um, what it means for your company and for the government if are asked to stop work for a period of time or the contract is terminated. Thanks. And Dial, this one's going to come over to you. Uh, please discuss future congressional oversight of the executive branch agencies with a responsibility for implementation of the COVID-19 legislation. Thank you, Jennifer. I think the most important thing to stress uh, for the participants of the call is that you know, th this is an unprecedented amount of money uh, being allocated to try and address this crisis. And you know, Congress is at some point going to exercise, as it should, its oversight authority uh, to determine how well this money is being spent and whether or not it's actually addressing the goals set out in the legislative packages and then subsequently the law. Uh, but let's hope that in the short term, uh, we get this money uh, to the agencies and that it is well spent. But uh, we will at some point see uh, oversight hearings, and these are going to be uh, 
from a range of committees, but I think some of the big ones that we're likely to see uh, some oversight uh, hearings for are the Finance Committee, uh, Senate Appropriations Committee, Health, Education, Labor for sure, and then of course for our purposes on this call, Small Business and Entrepreneurship, uh, similar committees in, in, in the House. Uh, but what I will say is important is that we understand how this uh, th this crisis uh, is impacting you, that as these uh, implementation guidelines go into the agencies and you start to get some of this, this money, I, I hope, to help us through this crisis, uh, that you're able to tell your specific story about how well this is working. Oversight ultimately is not to punish. It should be to correct things that we did not get right uh, in the legislation and the implementation. So I would urge everyone on the call, as you've heard probably a, a hundred times by now, uh, to uh, communicate with your contracting officer, but also don't forget your members of Congress. And when it's time uh, to really assess how well this has worked, uh, be prepared to tell your story specifically. Yes, there are trade associations, and I, I think Mayor Beth's uh, raising of them uh, is an excellent point. Uh, but ultimately, you also want to have your own specific story for how uh, this is impacting uh, your business, your employees, uh, your customers. Thank you. Okay, uh, number 35, when can we expect a turnaround and are there any things I can do to improve my federal contracting business during this time with growing or shrinking contracting opportunities? Ben? Yeah, I'll repeat, you know, some of what I said earlier. Um, I think that this is a healthcare crisis that is having financial side effects. So I think that the economy and the markets are going to turn around, you know, once there's a decline in people affected, or if we find out the virus is seasonal, or there's a treatment or a vaccine or a cure announced, um, or even if we find out that millions of people are affected, which would be strangely reassuring, because it would mean that there are far more people affected who aren't getting sick and dying, that would also be positive. Uh, but I think if investors and consumers that they're, if they see that there's a path to health, um, then the economy and the markets will have a turnaround. I think there will be a V-shaped recovery. I think government contractors and business owners also during the meantime should take several proactive steps. They should think about having a lot of cash on hand and reducing expenditures in anticipation of delayed revenues. Don't take on any further capital expenditures at this time that are big expenditures. Uh, consider if you can reduce your salary or your owner draws. Uh, consider pay cuts for employees instead of layoffs. Also consider reducing your own salary. This can create team unification and bonding instead of just laying people off. Um, if you've got a line of credit for your business or a home equity line of credit, you might want to consider tapping into that. Uh, we also mentioned the SBA loans earlier. Uh, if you can delay payments to vendors or suppliers, if that's possible, do that. Uh, delay uh, bonuses if you can for employees and your teammates. Um, if you can review current contracts, leases, lines of credit, debt, if you can renegotiate, um, this would be a good time to do that. Interest rates are very low right now. This is a good time to refinance if you can. Also leverage technology like we're doing now to interact with uh, prospects and uh, employees and your teammates. Um, so those are all things to consider. The last thing I'll say, just to, to close it out, uh, Winston Churchill once said, a pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity. An optimist sees the opportunity in every difficulty. So I'll leave you with that. Great. Thank you, Ben. Uh, 36. Will the contractor be protected years from now when DCAA, DCMA uh, performs an audit for the year 2020? For example, people are teleworking from home with a teleworking agreement in place, but the contractor is still billing us as if they are working at the contractor site. Margaret? Thanks, Jennifer. So, um, on this one, it, go, it goes back to what we've been sharing all along. You, you have to document it. I don't think you're going to get relieved of, it, of, 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 of exposure to any audit. It's like Mr. McNeil said, there is going to be oversight and there's, there is going to be audit um, at some point in the future to make sure that whoever got federal government funds, regardless of how they got them, whether it's a contractor or otherwise, that you were a good steward of those and that those funds were not um, fraudulently or otherwise misused. So if you have tele if you're teleworking and you have a teleworking agreement in place, then you need to document that and make sure that it's clear in your billing and invoicing that in fact your folks are working but they're teleworking. So it just again goes back to documenting. You don't want to hide things from the government. You don't want to not be transparent.
transparent with them and suggest things that may be inaccurate from what reality is. And that will be the best way to assure going forward when, when if you do get exposed to an audit that you'll be ready for that just, just as presumably you would be now. Great, thanks. And Mary Beth, over to you for this. Will the federal government assist small businesses by making money available to them in paying sick contract employees? Sure. Um, one thing that um, is helpful or may be helpful is that the um, the legislation that just passed gives the um, Department of Labor the discretion to issue regulations that would exempt employers um, who are have uh, employees of 50 or less. That's 50 or less. Um, from the requirement to pay their workers uh, for COVID-related um, sick leave or leave to take care of a family member. So that's the first thing, um, but we've got to wait for the Department of Labor uh, to uh, implement some regulations or some policy on that. And then, um, you know, I think the small business community, you know, is a constituency that most Congress people are very uh, responsive to. So, you know, you know, send them letters, give them calls, tell them what it's like uh, in the real world and see if you know you can you and and you know your contractor organizations can help to shape the legislation that's going through congress now in a way that's going to be helpful for the small business community great and 38 if we have uh contracts that do not include the Excusable delays clause uh, FAR 52 249-14 or FAR 52 2-2-212-4. Margaret, hmm. thanks, Jennifer. Yeah. Um, on 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 this one, um, I generally speaking, I wouldn't get so hard on whether you have the excusable delay clauses or not. Um, again, it goes back to a situation that is not controllable by you as a contractor or subcontractor. And if that's the case, general principles of contracting law and, and the federal government is included in this, will give you some sort of um, relief from continued performance and some sort of um, equitable payment for the work that you've done. So don't trouble yourself if you're looking through your clauses and you can't find it, that's certainly helpful, but there's certainly going to be other ways to approach contracts if you don't explicitly see that clause. And 39, Crystal, address the bill on emergency family leave expansion and emergency paid sick leave expected to be signed into law and its impact on businesses with fewer than 500 employees. Um, as was mentioned earlier by DL, um, on the uh -huh. president signed into law HR 620, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. Uh, this law would create emergency paid leave programs to um, respond to the outbreak. Specifically, it would impact private sector employers with fewer than 500 workers. Government entities um, would have to provide as many as 12 weeks of partially paid family leave under the, um, the Federal Medical um, Leave Act to care for a child whose school or daycare has been closed due to the outbreak. Um, employers are also going to be required to provide full and part-time workers with two weeks of paid sick time including for a quarantine order or to care for another affected individual. Um, and also, this has been mentioned already, the Labor Department um, could exempt small businesses with fewer than 50 workers uh, from the paid leave requirement. The paid leave would be financed through tax credits. These are refundable tax credits for employers to cover the cost under the law for sick leave and family leave programs. And it would also include amount uh, employers pay for a workers' health insurance program. And so, I mean, there's similar um, refundable credits um, for self-employed um, workers as well. Great. Thanks, Crystal. And Kevin, do we anticipate any contracting offices closing? Uh, if I had to go yes or no, I'd say no. Because the work's got to get done. I mean, several folks have mentioned on here that you know, the work doesn't go away. Uh, the government needs to be open. And, and likewise, on the contractor side, you want to show that you're open, that you're able to do your work, right? Um, even if you have to be creative in how you get it done. But I would say uh, no. Uh, I think they're going to be a little less responsive while they figure out how to make their VPN work, uh, particularly agencies that aren't. <laughs> 
oh, hang on, uh, people who aren't used to being uh, working from home uh, or aren't not at this scale anyway, there, there is going to be a little bit of, of a lag here, but not just no, but heck no, honestly. I, I can't imagine a scenario where that would make sense. And the only scenario might be if they if they move the work to another office. Like when you work in an agency that has, 10 different, contract, has con 10, 10 different contracting offices, they may merge some of the work just to keep it moving. But again, if you're working from home, yeah, I, I can't imagine that they would close. Okay, great, thank you. And uh, last question here, do we have any details about SBA's relief for small businesses or how to apply for those loans? Adam? So currently the SBA Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program is available directly from the SBA. If you go to sba.gov, you can find the details. It's by certain states, the states have to apply. If you look on the website, you can see DC, Maryland, Virginia have applied or eligible. These loans are directly from the SBA. Uh, so there's the, the they do have to process these loans directly. So it's kind of uncertain how long it'll take. So if you do want to apply, I would consider you apply as quickly as possible because they will likely have a get backed up. There's the current bill being discussed. The large bill does have large changes to the SBA 7A loan program, which are loans made directly by banks. And it has some uh, specific things in there, increasing the dollar size of the loan. But the bigger issues are it reduce, waives the lender and borrow fees, which would make the loans have no fees, increases the guaranteed portion of the loan to the bank to 100%, making it essentially no risk loan to the bank, and allow complete lo deferment of loan payments. And the bill also includes a process that allows borrowers to receive loan forgiveness in amount equal to the payroll cost and reduces the amount of potential forgiveness proportionally by the number of employees laid off during the covered period. Um, there's still some concern what will be in the final bill, but there's some uh, fast progress made during this. In the 2009 economic process, the SBA did make significant changes to the 7A program that moved very quickly to help uh, streamline loans to borrowers. Great, thank you, Adam. And that uh, that rounds out our questions. Uh, if you did send us a question that was not answered, you can email us directly at the hello at jenniferschaus.com email address, and we'll address those in the coming days. Most likely, we will have another webinar with um, with speakers to answer uh, the incoming questions as things are changing by the moment. Uh, again, thanks to Mary Beth, Margaret, DL, Crystal, Matt, Ben. Dan, Adam, Kevin, and Guy, uh, and everyone else, again, that I mentioned earlier who helped promote the event, uh, which was Walt Abbott over at SCORE, Tara Palacios at AED Biz Launch, Luann Brosman at Government Marketing University, Judy Bratt at Summit Insight, Scott Denniston at the National Veterans Small Business Coalition, uh, Mallory Flowers and everyone else from my team that helped put this together. Um, and thanks again, everybody. You can still send uh, us questions. Hello at jennifershouse.com, and we'll address those uh, in a future webinar. The recording uh, will be available later this afternoon. We're going to email that out. The slides will be available on slideshare.net. That's uh, connected to LinkedIn. So you'll get a, a notice uh, in the next, probably within the hour, uh, with a link to the recording and a, uh, and a link to the slides. Thanks again, everybody. Uh, wash your hands and stay safe and stay healthy. Bye-bye.